Today, we're going to talk about the misattribution of arousal and the two-factor theory of love. Theories of emotion have gone through uh, many different incarnations over the years, um, many of which were uh, counterintuitive, at least for the time. So, for example, William James, who's widely known as the father of American psychology, uh, came up with the idea that instead of uh, the uh, stimulus coming first and causing the emotion, uh, actually the emotion comes first and then you understand the emotion. So imagine that you see a bear and you feel afraid. One explanation is that you saw the bear and then you thought, hmm, how do I feel about bears? And you decided I should be afraid of them and then you said, aha, I'm afraid. Now I should uh, get some physiological arousal going, right? Fight or flight responses engage and you run away from the bear. William James proposed that it went the other way around, that instead, uh, what you experience first is the emotion, right? The bear happens, you experience the bear, and then you understand the emotion. So this sort of turns the order of uh, knowing what emotion you're sensing, the cognitive part of it, understanding the emotion, and the feeling the emotion, the arousal. Uh, it reverses the order from what you otherwise might think. Well, it turns out you can do some cool experiments that um, sort of explore that idea. And uh, I want to talk to you about two experiments today. One, uh, the first one, is um, uh, by Schachter and Singer, in, and this was done in 1962 when it was published. And uh, the idea is they, they, um, they took individuals and they said, uh, we want to figure out whether it's the cognition that uh, determines what emotion you're experiencing, or is it the arousal? Okay. And at the time, there was this idea floating around that, um, that arousal, uh, in the case of, say, fear, um, looks a lot like the same kinds of bodily responses that you get when you experience other types of arousal, uh, such as sexual arousal. Or, um, or excitement. So what they did is they took uh, a group of participants and they gave them an adrenaline shot. And they told them either that, uh, by the way, this adrenaline shot is going to have some side effects. Um, it's going to make you your heart race. It's going to make you breathe deeper. And it's going to... Uh, you know, uh, make your hair stand on end and that kind of thing. So basically, they gave them accurate information about what happens when you undergo physiological arousal. So that's what we call the um, informed condition. They had another condition in which they told the participants, uh, you know, you're going to get this shot and it might make you feel a little sleepy. Um, and uh, they gave them other symptoms that definitely are not what you experience when you experience arousal. And so they called this the misinformed condition. Right? The idea behind the informed and misinformed condition is it gets at what the participants are thinking. If the participant starts to feel a feeling, right, feel the arousal happening, and they think it's due to the shot, then they're just going to think that's the side effect of the shot. On the other hand, if they're misinformed, then they start to feel that arousal. That might leave them to interpret the arousal as from some other source. In other words, they might be able to misattribute that arousal to a different emotion. Okay, so now that we've got our participants, um, you know, uh, the, the adrenaline is kicking in and they're starting to sense the arousal, uh, you put them in a waiting room with another person. And it turns out there are two different conditions here too. In one condition, the person is um, is agitated and belligerent, and they're upset and angry about uh, having to be there, and they're visibly upset. In the other condition, the participant 
uh, the other participant that they're waiting with, which is actually a confederate in the experiment, uh, is acting elated and they're uh, so overjoyed and they're just having this euphoric experience. And then you measure what do you, what kinds of behaviors do people engage in uh, when they're in these different environments. Not surprisingly, in the informed condition where they knew what the effects of the drug were supposed to be, they observed uh, the participants um, just kind of watching the other, uh, the other person in the room sort of do their thing and they didn't really react much or respond much. Uh, and the idea there is that, well, of course they didn't because they knew any arousal that they were experiencing was a side effect of the drug. In the other condition, however, the participants who were misinformed about what the side effects of the drug would be uh, started to take on some of the, um, the emotional properties of the other individual in the room. Right? I'm feeling aroused and this person's angry, I must be angry too. Or I'm feeling aroused, this person's elated, I must be elated too. And so uh, they, uh, what they found was that for individuals who were misinformed about the possible side effects of the drug, they were more likely to take on, uh, interpret their arousal uh, as coming from an emotion. But the emotion depended on the context that they were in, the other people around them, the other, you know, the other stimuli in the environment. So the same physiological arousal could be interpreted in multiple ways. So this is called misattribution of arousal, and it leads us to something that's frequently called the two-factor theory of love, because in this case, you have two factors. One is the arousal, so that's one factor. The other factor is your cognition, right? your thinking, your interpretation of the arousal. And it's those two factors combined that determine what emotion you experience. So that leads us to our second study, which is uh, sometimes called the Bridge Study. And this was done by Dutton and Aaron in 1974. Uh, kind of a, uh, a fun uh, classic experiment. And the idea was they took people to, um, to a park where there was a huge suspension bridge. And this thing is big and scary and wobbly and, uh, you know, you, uh, like a, almost like a rope bridge that's uh, going to wobble around in the breeze and it's way high over the ground. This is a condition that generates a lot of arousal, right? What's your control condition? Well, they actually had a couple of control conditions. One was where they did kind of the same thing, but they gave people time after they got off the bridge to uh, sort of rest and calm back down. Another control condition was they just used a lower bridge that didn't uh, induce so much arousal. All right, so what was the experiment? Well, they had a, a, a female researcher stand at the end of the bridge. And as men crossed the bridge, they would uh, have her take them aside and uh, administer uh, the thematic apperception test, which is a projective test. Doesn't really matter. Uh, so much, but they gave a, they were supposed to make a neutral, uh, they, they gave them a neutral picture and they were supposed to make a story out of the picture. And then later they went and they scored the stories for uh, the amount of sexual content. The other thing they measured was they gave, uh, at the end of the, ex the um, experimental session, the researcher gave the men their phone number and uh, her phone number and said, uh, if you have any questions about the experiment, please call me. And they measured the number of people who gave her callbacks. Now, what they found was that if individuals crossed that rickety bridge and had all this arousal and didn't have time, either time to rest and overcome that arousal or didn't go over a bridge that created the arousal in the first place, then they were far more likely to call the, uh, the researcher back, and they were also um, more likely to uh, in, include sexual content in their stories. And the idea there is they misattributed their arousal. As they cross this bridge, they get all this arousal going, 
there's a scary stimulus there. Um, and when they get to the end of the bridge, that stimulus is gone, but there stands in front of them uh, a, a researcher. And so the arousal then becomes attributed to the researcher. So what's the takeaway here? Well, there's a reason why scary movies and roller coasters are classic date experiences. You go on something scary and you induce that physiological arousal, which is kind of fun anyway, but you induce that arousal. And then when you get off the roller coaster, the arousal inducing stimulus is gone, but the heart is still pounding. The, the eyes, pupils are still dilated and uh, your brain is trying to make sense of uh, what's the cause of all this arousal. Well, the, the roller coaster is not there anymore, but guess who is? That's right, you. So uh, you can trick that person into falling in love with you, or at least that's the idea. You can cause the individual to misattribute the arousal they're, they're experiencing to you. You're creating those butterflies in their stomach. Um, anyway, that's the idea behind the misattribution of arousal and the two-factor theory of love. That's all for now. See you next time.